Here we go, folks. This is a 2006 Bugatti Veyron, and it is one of the all-time coolest cars ever made. It has a thousand horsepower. It cost a million and a half dollars back when it was new, and when it debuted almost 15 years ago now, it was the fastest production car in the world. Today, I'm going to give you a full review of it. I've borrowed this Veyron from CNC Motors here in Southern California. This is basically the premier luxury and exotic car dealership in this entire region. They have basically everything. Now, I've filmed a lot of cars with CNC before, but nothing like this. And yet, this is the second Veyron that CNC has. You can check out their inventory if you click the link in the description below. This place is automotive heaven. But back to the Veyron. Now, to me, this is the most special special sports car manufactured in its era, sort of like the McLaren F1 in the 1990s and the Ferrari F40 in the 1980s. Back when this car came out, it didn't matter if you were into cars, you knew the stats because everybody knew the stats because they were everywhere. Top speed, 253 miles an hour, 10 radiators, four turbochargers. It could suck in as much air in one minute as a normal person breathes in four days. It'll run out of fuel in just 12 minutes at its top speed. You gotta change the tires every 2,500 miles and you gotta change the wheels with every third tire change. It doesn't matter if you like the Veyron or hate it. You got to admit, it is a marvel of engineering and insanity and hilarity all wrapped up into one. The Veyron was sold from 2006 to 2015 when it was finally replaced by the Chiron. This is my favorite Veyron because it was the original Veyron, the one that captivated us all when it came out all those years ago. Later, Veyron models were definitely better. There was the Grand Sport, which was a convertible, and the Super Sport and the Vitesse, which had more power. But to me, this is the Veyron, the original, the one that started it all. Regardless of which one you get, they're all special. Bugatti only made 450 Veyrons for the entire planet during its 10-year production run. But anyway, today's the day you've been waiting for because today's the day I'm going to review a Bugatti Veyron. First, I'm going to show you around it and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of one of the craziest cars ever made. Then I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive it and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Veyron, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've compiled a list of the five cars I would buy for the price of this one. Now I'm going to start the quirks and features up front with the grill. Now you can see that the grill design is very distinctive with sort of this half circle on the top and then it's flat on the bottom. That grill design goes back decades and decades to early Bugatti models from like the 1920s. Bugatti's race cars all had this same grill shape. And even though Bugatti has changed hands several times since then, and obviously they're now making modern cars, they kept the grill design, which is a pretty cool throwback to the old days. Now, one other interesting thing up in the front the headlights. The headlights themselves are xenon, as you might expect from a car from this era. Interestingly, the turn signals are just halogen bulbs. You pay a million five for a car and you get halogen front turn signals. Now, all the rear lights are LEDs, which was a pretty big deal when this car came out, but the front turn signals in a Bugatti Veyron are halogen, just like in most normal cars. And speaking of normal items on this car, I draw your attention to the door handle. Now, these days, exotic cars have crazy door handles and door opening mechanisms. I'm thinking especially of Koenigsegg and others, but back Back in the day, 10 years ago, that wasn't as common. Bugatti just stuck a normal everyday door handle in this car. You just pull it and it opens up just like every Audi, Volkswagen, and probably your car. But that's about where the similarities end between the Veyron and your car. One thing your car doesn't have, massive air intakes. Okay, there's two over the roof of the car and they are huge, but that's not enough air for this thing. This is an eight liter, 16 cylinder quad turbo. It needs to suck in as much air as it can. And so integrated into the side of the car, you have two additional air intakes, one on either side. So the car can just bring as much air as possible into this massive engine. And 
speaking of that engine, I would show it to you, but I can't. You can't open the hood in this car and look at the engine or service the engine. Bugatti leaves that to the trained professionals, but they do give you a little bit of a consolation prize. Unlike a Ferrari where you have to look at the engine through the glass engine cover, in this car you can see it right there. The part that is visible is very visible, and you can see it says 16.4, which meant 16 cylinders, four turbochargers. That is a very, very cool thing to look at from the back of this car. One interesting item you might notice that's unique about the engine in this day run is the fact that it's painted black. And in fact, everything about this car is painted black. When these cars first came out, Bugatti wanted people to get two tones and kind of experiment with colors but this person decided to go black, 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 and that includes the engine. I'm not sure if Bugatti painted the engine black or if the first owner had someone else do it, but it completes the black motif of this particular Veyron. Now, next up, I wanna move on to the rear lights of the Veyron, which are LEDs, and they have some interesting operation. When you press the brakes in the Veyron, all four rear circle lights light up in red as brake lights. Now, when you put on the turn signal, the outer light breaks off and becomes the turn signal. It's no longer the brake light. It is now the turn signal, and it flashes like a normal turn signal. The most interesting thing, though, is the rear fog light. When you turn on the rear fog light, the inner half of the inner lights on both sides lights up and becomes the rear fog light. It's kind of an interesting design when you see it on, and that's how the rear fog light works in a Veyron. Other interesting items back here. One is obviously the exhaust. This car doesn't have quad exhaust pipes or whatever. Instead, it has one giant center exhaust pipe. And actually, this car sounds pretty good. I've always heard it described as like a turbine, not like a really true sports car, but it sounds decent. Take a listen. Now, another very obvious item we have to discuss is, of course, the wing, which is absolutely massive. Now, one interesting thing before I explain the wing, check this out. When you start the car, the wing kind of does a little dance. That's because it's checking to make sure it's working every time you start the car. And if it wasn't working, it would send you a little fault up in the gauge cluster to let you know the wing was broken after it does its little test. But you might be wondering, why is it so massive? Well, it doesn't have to be this big. The car is currently in handling mode, and when the Veyron goes into handling mode, you can see it gets a little bit lower in order to get closer to the ground for better grip, and then the wing comes up to provide extra downforce, which also provides better grip on the racetrack. Now, if you take the car out of handling mode and put it in normal mode, the wing retreats back into the car so it isn't as massive and aggressive since you don't need all that downforce. Additionally, the car lifts itself back up just a little bit, presumably because if you're in normal mode, you're no longer on the racetrack, now you're back on the street, and you probably need to clear stuff like speed bumps or low curbs. Now, one interesting item to note when you're in handling mode and when the wing is up is that if you look in here, it's really ugly. They didn't bother to cover any of this stuff. You can just see the inner workings of the wing and the rear of the car, but actually it's pretty cool to look back in there and see all that stuff. And I guess Bugatti must have figured, you know, you're only going to have the wing up when you're in handling mode on a racetrack, ready to be aggressive and drive crazy. And so maybe you'd want to take a look inside the car and see its guts. So I've mentioned handling mode and normal mode, but there's still one other interesting mode the Veyron has, and that's called top speed mode and accessing it is rather interesting. When you open up the door, you look down, one of the first things you'll notice is there's a little keyhole on the floor next to the seat. In order to get the car into top speed mode, you have a special key called the top speed key that you have to insert into that little keyhole and twist to let the car know that you are confirmed that you actually want to go the top speed. If you don't stick the top speed key in, the car will not go its full top speed of 200 and 53 miles an hour, you actually have to be in that mode. And when you get into that mode, the wing goes all the way into the car. It lowers itself to be as slippery as possible so you can go as fast as you possibly can. But top speed mode isn't the only interesting item you'll find when you first open the door. Next to top speed mode, you can see there are two little silver circular buttons and they open the two 
exterior flaps on the outside of the car. Now, one of them is the fuel tank. You press it, and then the fuel door opens up on the passenger side, and that makes sense, a flap for the fuel door. So what's the other one? Well, look at that little silver button, and you can see a little oil icon on it. Press it, and it opens the flap on the driver's side, and that's where you can add oil to your Veyron. Remember, you can't get into the engine. There's no engine cover to open to add oil, and so to make it easier to add oil rather than removing the whole piece, which you can only do in the workshop, Bugatti added an easy flap so you can just dump a bottle of motor oil in your Veyron. And the other interesting item you'll notice in the footwell area right when you open the door is that there is a little handle in the driver's footwell. You can pull it and it opens the front trunk. And so let us go see what's in the front trunk of a Bugatti Veyron. Now to actually access the front trunk after you pull that little handle in the driver footwell, there is a little latch here. You lift it and then you can open the front trunk right up. And so here it is. Here is the front trunk in a Bugatti Veyron. There are a few noteworthy items in this trunk. One is the fact that you can see this little black panel in here. What exactly is this? Well, here's what I've learned. The United States government requires that all automakers have a little emergency inside trunk release in case you try to kidnap someone with your vehicle so they can pull the release and get out of the trunk. However, that requirement only extends to vehicles that have a trunk of a certain size. I guess that size is about the size of like a three or four year old child dummy. If the child dummy can't fit in your trunk, then you don't need the emergency inside release. So Bugatti puts this black panel in here in order to divide the trunk into two sections, neither of which is large enough to take the dummy. And that means they don't have to install an ugly plastic emergency inside trunk release a very interesting item. Other items worth noting in the trunk, one is the little warning label above the trunk that says, attention, temperature inside the trunk may exceed 122 degrees Fahrenheit. The theory there is they don't want you to put anything in here that, well, can't handle getting a little hot because it may get hot in here. The other interesting item is there is a little plaque in the front of the trunk that has this beautiful inscription, Bugatti Automobiles, and it gives your chassis number and it says country of destination, USA 3. Boy, I wonder what life's like in USA 1. It'd be so nice to live there. Unfortunately, I'm relegated to life in USA 3. Maybe someday, someday. Anyway, moving back to the door panel, a couple of interesting items worth noting here. One is the lock unlock icon. It looks like a fairly standard lock unlock icon, but the unlock part has a picture of a Veyron on it from the top down. Little details like that are what you get when you pay over a million dollars for a car. Next up onto the window switches, which look like standard window switches, except they go the opposite way. When you push the window switch down, the window goes up. Push the window switch up, the window goes down. Why? <laughs> Did you do this just to be different, Bugatti? Next up, another odd item with the window. How about the fact that it doesn't roll all the way down? This is the window in its furthest rolled down position, and it doesn't go all the way into the door, which is obviously unusual for any car, and especially one at this price point. Two other items worth noting with the door panel. One is the fact that there is a little storage pocket inside the door panel of your one and a half million dollar fastest production car in the world. The other interesting item with the door panel is the fact that it is Alcantara. Now that's not that unusual. A lot of cars have a lot of Alcantara stuff, but this car takes it to a whole new level. Everything in this car is Alcantara. The seats, Alcantara. The center console, Alcantara. The area around the door frame, Alcantara. The dashboard is Alcantara. The steering wheel, there's even some crazy Alcantara pieces. How about the fact that the window switches are Alcantara? You will never see that again. And then there's my personal favorite, the key. The key is wrapped in Alcantara. That's the level of Alcantara that we're on on this vehicle. Basically everything is made of that material. Now, speaking of the key, one unusual item about it is the fact that it's just a Volkswagen folding key. Take a look at a Passat from this era and you'll see the exact same key, except it's not Alcantara, 
and it doesn't have the Bugatti logo on it. That's really the only apparent change they made to this, which is a big surprise to me considering how special this car is. Also odd about the key, it only has lock and unlock buttons on it. It doesn't have a button on it to pop the front trunk. In order to do that, you have to pull that little latch in the driver's footwell. Another item worth noting is the fact that between the door sill and the seat, there is this nice little storage cubby, which is of course finished in Alcantara. I would expect no less. Now, I mentioned that little Alcantara storage compartment over on the driver's side because over here on the passenger side, there is also an Alcantara storage compartment, but it is much, much smaller. And the reason it's much smaller is because right in front of it, you have a little Alcantara compartment. You open that up and that's where the road hazard triangle is. This is compulsory, required in some countries. They had to put it somewhere and so they hid it in that little panel there. You'd never know it was there unless you know it's there. And speaking of the passenger side of the Veyron, one interesting item on the passenger door panel is the fact that right next to the interior door handle, there is a blank panel where the power mirror controls and the power lock controls would be on a right-hand drive car. Bugatti just leaves that panel blank on left-hand drive cars rather than restyling the whole door panel to accommodate it. I never thought I would see a blank panel on a $1.5 million car, but here we are. Next up, moving in to the Bugatti Veyron. The first thing you notice when you climb into this one is the fact that the seat is really tight. It really, really hugs you. It's kind of surprising. That's because this car has racing style seats, full carbon fiber seats like you would find in a Porsche GT3 RS, although not quite that crazy. But here's the really special thing about them. They're manual. This is a $1.5 million car with manual seats. There's a little lever you gotta pull, and that's the only way to move the seat forward or backwards. It's ridiculous. You know, I made fun of Audi in the RS3 for installing a manual passenger seat, and that's like a $70,000 car. Here they're installing manual seats in a $1.5 million car. The Volkswagen Group really knows how to get you with options. Of course, I'm kidding. I think these are actually optional seats. There's a more luxurious seat that's standard. This is for people who really want that sporty seat experience. Now, one interesting item with the seats, even though they're manual and carbon fiber, they're heated, which is a big surprise because in most cars that have carbon fiber racing seats, you can't get them heated, but you can in the Veyron because, I mean, <laughs> it's the Veyron. You can do whatever you want. Now, next we move on to the floor mats, which are pretty incredible. Generally, they just look like floor mats, but in the middle, there's this aluminum trimmed EB Bugatti logo that is just beautiful. You don't get a floor mat like that in your Acura. Now, that same material that makes the Bugatti logo in the floor mat is also used in the center control stack in this car. It's one of the few things that breaks up all the black. And the center control stack in this car, to me, is absolutely fascinating. The first fascinating thing about it is the fact that it has the same shape as the grill. Do you notice that? You got the little half circle on top, it's square on the bottom. They designed this to bring the grill shape into the car and keep that Bugatti heritage going, and that is pretty cool. Now, even cooler, around the entire center control stack is one giant grill-shaped climate control vent, which is just so cool. It's only about an inch wide and it goes around the entire thing and it's just a big extra climate vent that you probably never even knew was there. I certainly didn't. In order to turn it on or off, there are these two little plastic sliders you can move up or down and that adjusts the climate vent in the middle that most people probably don't even realize is in the Veyron. Now, next up, I'm gonna go down to the bottom of the center control stack and sort of work my way up. And that means starting with the starter. You can see there's a start button in this car, but that's not how you start it. To start it, you have to unfold the Volkswagen foldy key, stick it into the ignition switch, which is in the normal place, twist that, and then press the starter button. You can't just keep the key in your pocket and push the starter. Now, when you do push the starter button, you are greeted by a tremendously distinctive noise from the inside of this car, everything firing up. Take a listen. Now, next up above the starter button, you have the transmission lever, which is rather odd. And indeed it operates in a kind of a strange manner, but it's pretty intuitive once you get used to it. The transmission is always in sort of a neutral middle position. 
In order to move it into reverse, you move it over to the left for neutral, then down into reverse, and you're in reverse. If you want to move it over to drive, you move it to the right, and you're in drive. And moving it to the right can switch between drive and sport mode. If you want to put it in park, you press the top of the gear lever, the aluminum bit, and then the car goes into park. And just like in the Chiron, this car annoys me by saying press for park, press in lowercase, park in uppercase. Why must you do that, Bugatti? Now, next up, around the gear lever, one of the items you'll notice is the heated seat controls, which are kind of odd. They're these aluminum dials, and you slide them up, and you can see the little light in the middle, which turns red, gets a little larger each time you slide it as you go for more and more heated seat. No ventilated seats in this car, just heated. Now, below the heated seat to the left of the gear lever, you have a button that says LC. That would be launch control for if you want to go faster than this car can do without launch control. To the right of the gear lever, that's the button that changes the car between normal mode and handling mode. You can see it has an arrow on the wing and arrows on the body of the car itself since it raises or lowers the car depending on which mode you choose. Now above the heated seat control, you will notice that in the entire center control stack, there's no screen. And that was intentional. Even though a lot of cars from this era, the mid 2000s, late 2000s had screens, Bugatti decided against it because they wanted this car to be timeless. They wanted you to be able to show this thing at Pebble Beach in 2037 and not have to sort of explain away the ugly old touch screen that came out of cars from this era. That was actually a really good idea because if you get into a 2006 car now and you use the touch screen, you'll notice that it's terrible and it would have dated this interior, but they didn't do that. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out perfectly that the interior is timeless because they did add a few display screens and they're very pixelated. You can see it looks like mid 2000s era Volkswagen and it just doesn't look that good by modern standards. But it's a lot better than having one big old school screen taking up the middle of this car. Now, the first set of controls, as you move up the center control stack, you'll see the climate controls, and they're not particularly unusual. You have all your typical buttons, auto, you can adjust where the air comes out. One thing I like is that as you change and adjust these things, they light up in red when you move the little silver switches to highlight whatever you want. The coolest thing about the climate controls is that the dial in the middle, I I always thought was fixed, it's actually a dial. You can move it and that adjusts the climate control temperature. So as you move that, the temperature gets warmer or cooler depending on what you want, which is pretty cool. Above that, you have a little CD slot, which is just the coolest CD slot in the world. I will say in all of Bugatti's wisdom not to put a screen in this car, they did kind of date it by sticking a CD slot in there, but at least it looks cool even though we're no longer listening to CDs. Now above the CD slot, you have the radio controls and they work a lot like the climate controls. You can select various things using the little silver toggle switches and they turn red when you select them, which is a cool little feedback to see. Also, same deal with the climate controls, the giant silver dial in the middle, that would be the stereo volume. As you turn it, you can turn up or down the volume. Something else I didn't know about the stereo in this car. Now, next up above the climate controls, you have a few other interesting items. You have the two circular air vents that sort of complement the grill-shaped air vent around the center console. You also have the giant hazard light button right in the middle. And above that, you have the Bugatti clock, which is, of course, very beautiful, but how do you adjust it? There's no hour or minute thing anywhere. And there's no screen you can use to adjust it. So what do you do? Well, it turns out you open up the glove box and to do that, you press this big silver unlabeled button over to the right of the center control stack. The glove box opens up in this incredibly soft, luxurious manner, like you would expect from a high-end vehicle such as this. And then you can see over on the right side of the glove box, there is a little clock adjuster so that you can change the time and your brilliant Bugatti clock. Other interesting items in this interior, one is the air vents. Aside from the vents in the middle, there are vents to the left of the steering wheel and over on the passenger side, and they have an odd shape to them. It's a shape that actually mimics the accelerator pedal shape, which is odd. You don't often see that air vent accelerator pedal shape tie-in, but you do in this car. One item I absolutely love about this car has to do with the center console. Now, it doesn't open, and it's finished in this black Alcantara with nice white stitching. 
But Bugatti knows that having an unopening center console is annoying, so they gave you the smallest consolation prize ever. You have this tiny little oval-shaped item that doesn't close right above the center console for you to put in tiny items. You don't get a full center console, but you get that. It is unfortunately not even large enough for a modern cell phone. Next, we move on to the ceiling right here next to the mirror. A couple of interesting items, starting with these little switches that turn on the dome lights. These switches are Alcantara, because of course they are. Even the thing that turns on the dome lights in this car is Alcantara. Now, the furthest forward of the two switches turns on all of the dome lights at once, but say you don't want them all on, the switch in back has you covered, also Alcantara, of course. If you move it forward, it turns on the driver side lights. If you move it backwards, it turns on just the passenger side lights. One other interesting item in the ceiling area is the sun visors, which in this car are pretty special. There's no like hinged thing you pull down. Instead, it's just part of the black Alcantara headliner. It's like a little flap. You just pull it down and that's your sun visor. You put it back up and it goes away. No visor mirror, no ugly hinges, and no airbag warning label like you get in so many other cars. Somehow Bugatti got out of that or the owner removed it. Finally, we move on to the gauge cluster, which has a couple of cool things about it. Maybe my favorite is the fact that none of the warning lights are lit up or even potentially lit up. You can't even see that they're in there until you start turning stuff on and then they light up as if they're hidden and just waiting to spring into action. I really like that because I hate looking at gauge clusters that have the outline of all the warning lights. It just looks ugly. In this car, they concealed it and it is very, very cool. Now, the gauge cluster in this car, of course, isn't your typical gauge cluster. You start over on the left, and that's the power meter, which shows how much horsepower you're using in any given moment. You can see the very last number on there is 1,001. This car had 1,001 horsepower, and so when you have the foot on the floor, the power meter is all the way up, and you're using all 1,000 horses. Now, right in the middle, you have the tachometer, as you do in a lot of sports cars, and over on the right, you have the speedometer which goes to 280 miles an hour. You won't see a lot of cars with a 280 speedo. I also like the fact that the speedometer has this tiny little speed readout right in the middle. I almost feel like they put that in there thinking that Instagram would come in the future and there would be Instagram kids who would want to be like, oh, I got to get a picture of the speed readout. <laughs> and so they have that in there for that express purpose. Now, unfortunately, the gauge cluster suffers from the same problem as the center control stack with this pixelated black and white display in the middle of of the tachometer. Again, it's not as bad as if there was a screen in there from the old days, but it doesn't exactly look great. Now, moving on from the gauge cluster, you have the stalks coming off the steering wheel. They're pretty standard. On the left, you have the turn signal stalk. Move it up down for the turn signals. That also controls the cruise control. You just flip it, and then it can turn on or off. Over on the right, you have the wiper stock. Again, pretty simple, nothing particularly special about it. It's just the wiper stock. And in the middle, of course, you have the steering wheel, the Bugatti Veyron steering wheel with the giant EB logo. Press it, and you have the horn. What does a horn sound like in the Bugatti Veyron? Well, take a listen. And so that's the unbelievably long rundown of all of this car's incredible quirks and features. But wait, I'm not done because now it's time to get this thing out on public roads and drive it. And of course, I am very nervous. All right, driving the Veyron. I have wanted to do this my entire adult life. I've never even sat in a Veyron uh, until this moment. Um, one interesting one about this one, I can't lower the seat, it seems like. I can move it forward and backward, and I have enough room there, but my head is kind of right up against the ceiling. Also, the pedals are surprisingly offset, which, which is unusual. This car, with all the development dollars, they weren't able to get the pedals just a little bit more in the middle. Um, it's almost like an old-school supercar where it's just a little off to the side, which is kind of surprising. Just driving it, you know, normally it drives surprisingly normally, which is a cool thing, I think, and that's something that a lot of people have said about this car, and so it's a very usable car. Compared to Chiron and already feels a little bit more raw. You can hear a little bit more, you can feel the road a little bit more, uh, which is surprising to me. And pulling onto the highway in this thing, I mean, this is a Veyron. Like, this was everything to me when I was in high school, when I was in college. It was the coolest car in the world. You know, now there's all these million plus dollar hypercars, but this was the, the seminal one. And young people growing up now just sort of take for granted that there's a market for these cars, but there wasn't always. It's 
just so fast. It's so fast and so, so, so fast. And it's angry. This car feels a lot angrier and, and less refined, but almost in a good way compared to Chiron. Like, it actually feels a little bit more you know, menacing and, and, and mad, which surprises me. It's just insane. You're just not ready for it, and it just keeps coming. That is a speed that I definitely shouldn't be going on the highway, and it just feels like there is so much more to go. Now, in terms of just sitting here, not going too fast, it's fairly surprisingly useful. Like, the seats are a little huggy, but other than that, and then the headroom issue, which I imagine you could also solve if you had a seat that would sort of lower. Um, other than that, though, this is, you hear more of the road than in the Chiron, for sure. People say it's like this is like a Bentley, but just crazier. It's not quite. Bentleys are definitely, a, there's a little bit more luxury to them. Now, I am cruising at 80 miles an hour, 2,000 RPM, and the car is telling me instant MPG is 32.2, which is shocking. Now, when I put some gas on it, 8.4, 5.5. Another amazing thing to me, though, really, is the fact that I kind of feel like I could drive this to a reasonable degree. I mean, you'd be scared an incredible amount of people bumping into it, of parking it anywhere, of you know people in traffic trying to take a picture and they were off the road. But if you could get past that, you could live with this car more than a lot of the supercars that I do. special to me when I was younger and I've always wanted to drive it and it's just amazing to actually do it and honestly it kind of lives up to my expectations it's you know now that I've driven Chiron it's like well there's a better version but this was the original this is where it got, got started and that's really cool and so that's the Bugatti Veyron I already filmed the Chiron which is the car that followed this up came later but to me it isn't quite the same the Veyron blazed the trail and the Chiron merely followed it. I was 10 years old when they first showed the Veyron concept car. I was 16 when it finally came out as a production car. And I remember I would talk to my friends on AOL Instant Messenger and on internet forums about all the crazy stats related to this car, usually stuff we had heard on Top Gear the night before. I know a lot of people think that the Veyron isn't that great because it's very expensive and it's not very accessible and it's not some driver's sports car like a Ferrari or a Porsche, but to me, this will always be one of the greatest feats of automotive engineering in my lifetime. And I have always wanted to drive it. And now it's time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Veyron was never the world's most beautiful car. It looked nice, but it was never gorgeous, and now it's getting older, it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration, it gets an easy 10 out of 10. Handling is good, not amazingly sharp by the standards of modern exotics, but surprisingly quick on its feet, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Fun factor is obvious, this is one of the most exciting and smile-inducing cars ever made, and it gets a 10 out of 10. Cool factor 2 is obvious, few cars ever made turn heads like a Bugatti Veyron, and it gets a 10 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 45 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features where it's surprisingly far behind with no infotainment, manual seats, and not a lot of tech, it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is surprisingly low. It's better than purpose-built exotic cars like the Carrera GT or the F40, but it's harsher than I expected and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is fantastic in terms of materials, but reliability is a challenge and maintenance costs are truly astronomical, which limits it to a 7 out of 10. Practicality is low with only two seats, a small trunk, and ridiculous 
attention grabbing and it gets a 1 out of 10. Value is only okay. Someday I think these will be worth huge money, but for now they're depreciating. CNC is asking a million dollars for this car and maintenance and repair costs keep a lot of people away. Still, it's a very special car and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 22 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 67 out of 100, which places it here next to the other flagship supercars from recent years. It's no longer the class leader, but it's important to explain just how, well, important this car was. The Bugatti Veyron blazed the trail into the world of the hypercar, and to me it's still one of the all-time most important sports cars in automotive history.